Thank you. Let's welcome Alex. Yeah, I'm going to start off just sort of showing you guys some of my work. Uh, kind of give a behind the scenes look at some of my photos, what I did to achieve those photos, and uh, how they came to be. So first of all, who here has Photoshop? Probably a lot. Okay, does anyone not not have Photoshop? There you go, that's a great starting point. In fact, we'll get into that, but almost every Photoshop project, for me at least, starts in Lightroom. Yeah. So yeah, we're scrolling through a few samples on my website. Uh, might be a good time to uh, give a quick little intro. Um, so as, as Sandy mentioned, uh, professional photographer with an office here in downtown SB. Um, my primary niches in photography are fine art and architecture. Um, so in the fine art world, it's landscapes, prints, a lot of compositing, digital art, uh, showing in galleries, etc. And then the commercial side is shooting architecture. And among my clients and fellow photographers, I'm probably best known for my extensive use of post-production in Photoshop. We'll get right into it. So first I wanted to talk about why would you use Photoshop? There's often a stigma around the word Photoshop and then sometimes it's thought of as you know, maybe even cheating, like a re what's reality, or it's altering, you know, something so it's less natural. But what I find interesting about it is you can use Photoshop in multiple ways. So on one hand, you can use it to bring elements together that, you know, are unnatural or that wouldn't actually exist in the same, in the same uh, photo. And in that way, you are creating this surreal scene and on the other hand I use Photoshop actually a lot for this almost more than I do for surreal uh, photos is making a photo look more real and by that I mean the way you experience the world with your eyes is much different than a camera the way a camera sensor can interpret the world and I'm sure anyone has noticed this if you pull out a cell phone an iPhone and go to take a picture of someone in front of a sunset and you have to make a sacrifice. Either the person is you know, properly exposed and then the background is all white, or you expose for the beautiful sunset and then they're just in shadow. And as I'm sure a lot of you guys know, that's called dynamic range. So because of that you know, phenomenon, a camera sensor is limited in that way. So if you were to take a single exposure, like I said, especially in, in uh, scenarios of high contrast like this, um, you're ultimately sacrificing either highlight or shadow. And this is straight from camera, raw. This is a drone shot of the SB Harbor, as I'm sure you can tell. Um, so let's see here. Just for example's sake, let's just go through and make some basic exposures in Lightroom. And this, the, this is sort of an attempt to demonstrate why you would bring a photo like this into Photoshop instead of uh, just stopping at Lightroom edits or, or just limiting yourself to Lightroom edits. So <clears throat> just right off the bat, we're going to be really quick and dirty, but bring down the highlights, bring up the shadows, maybe even add a gradient exposure. Same thing, sort of paint in here. Now this is very uh, imperfect, but that's okay for this, for the purpose of this example. Um, but anyway, so we're making progress. Let me actually make my screen a little brighter. And just, just a quick look at the before and after. So clearly it's better, you know, it's, it's better in the sense of you can see more detail in the scene. You can, you know, it now picks up more of the detail in the highlights and in the sky and then also in the shadows. You know, I might use this for a proof for a client or a proof for myself as you know, sort of a sample of what, uh, what this scene or what this landscape shot could look like. But it, that's, that's sort of it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't print this, I wouldn't you know, deliver it to a client. I'm not utilizing all the detail that my sensor can pick up. And so what I would do instead, and if you, know, if you look here at my grid, you can see uh, what I almost always do when I'm shooting anything really, landscape, architecture. The only time I wouldn't do this is if it was 
uh, portraiture or a wedding or an event where the environment is very fast paced and you don't have time and like things are moving in the scene. But anytime it's a landscape architecture or things aren't moving, um, then I would take, I would do what's called bracketing and take multiple exposures. And most cameras these days have the capability to do bracketing and, you know, either plus one, minus one, plus two. Um, in this case, I think it was uh, the drone is two exposures, uh, two exposures overexposed, and then two underexposed. And you can see what it's doing. So basically, the underexposed shot will then reveal more detail than that middle exposure, and then same with the overexposed shots. So it'll it will reveal that detail in the shadow area. So this is kind of the same as I showed you before. This is as far as I can stretch one exposure um, just using Lightroom. And then if you hit to the next photo, this is the same version but using Photoshop to blend those bracketed exposures together. And I don't know if it's obvious at first glance, but really the main area of focus that, that stands out the most to me is this, whoops, this highlight right here where the sun was. And you can see it's, you know, this all, it's just sort of lost detail. Like there's a certain point where if it's overexposed too much, you can't recover that detail. You need another exposure um, that captures that detail and blend it in later. But I just wanted to quickly show you and explain why you would use Photoshop. And, and also a way that you would use Photoshop that's not necessarily the way people would expect to. So it's not making this scene look uh, more surreal, it's making it look more real, in my opinion, because this is how you would have experienced this scene with your, your human eye. Um, because like I said before, the human eye can pick up a, a larger range of detail. Um, so anyway, does everybody see that? You, you guys can see what I'm going for there? Questions? Yes, yeah, so you don't, um go to merge in HDR in, in Lightroom? Lightroom? Do you prefer Photoshop? <laughs> yeah, no, great question. Um, personally, I do prefer Photoshop because it's a little more control. There are plenty of software, including Lightroom, that can auto-generate HDR photos. And it's, that's a great place to start. It's a great place to, you know, if, you, if you're trying to keep your workflow a little quicker and you're trying to learn about the concept, but overall, um, the problem with doing that and, and the problem with most HDR softwares is they will look at every part of this scene, every part of the composition, and essentially almost neutralize the contrast. So certain areas you do want to be brighter. So like, for example, the boats or, or this little patch of brightness here, up here, if you, if you let the computer think on its own and just say, all right, every single pixel that's a little bit brighter, bring it down. Every pixel that's darker, bring it up. What you end up with is a little, is kind of a, a flat, uh, muddy image. And I'm sure you guys have encountered those. I, I should have done one as an example, but, and the reason for that is it's applying it to everything in the scene. Whereas when you're doing it in Photoshop, you have the power to, you know, selectively um, decide what's recovered and what's not. And so it maintains the, the more, a more natural look, um, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Did we have another question? Or? Do you use masking into the deck? Absolutely. Yes. So masking is, and, and as we'll get into, uh, there's a few fundamentals of Photoshop that, you know, in order to really do anything, you need to wrap your head around a few fundamental concepts, one of which is selections, masking, um, layers, things like that. And we'll, once we actually dive into Photoshop, we'll, we'll talk more about that. <clears throat> so one more example, same deal here. Shooting interiors of architecture is extremely difficult to properly expose um, the interior and, and out the windows the way that you know, your eye would experience this scene when you're there in person. Um, and again, I'm sure everyone has encountered this to quickly uh, give a disclaimer, I'm not saying that every single interior needs to recover windows. In fact, there's a lot of photographers, especially interior design photographers, that intentionally will blow out the windows just like you see here. And you know the reason for that is 
they're trying to tell a different story. There are occasions where you could make that creative decision to intentionally not recover that the windows. But in most cases, when I'm photographing architecture uh, for commercial and client purposes, I would want to recover window detail. You know, it tells more about the scene, it tells more about the building and its location. Definitely get a, a solid tripod, set it to bracketing. So, you know, you've got your high exposures and you got your low exposures. And again, you know, we zoom in here and that's a properly exposed exterior. But you zoom out and obviously that's not really telling me much about the interior. In fact, that makes this place look kind of bland and boring and like you want to really emphasize how the natural light spills into this interior and, and just bounces around and, and really uh, shows off the place. This exposure right here is uh, one single raw file, you know, reduce the highlights, raise the shadows, punch in a little contrast, etc. Now if you were to do multiple, expo multiple exposures, this is uh, a more accurate result of what I'm looking for in my photography and this is, this is the result I ended up getting. So the window de um, detail is all recovered. You can see, you know, the mountains, you can see the parking lot, and also the interior still feels bright and, and open and airy. So it's, to me, the difference is, is huge. And, you know, once I really discovered this, I, I saw no other way of achieving uh, the photos that I wanted to deliver to my clients. Anyway. Uh, do you use uh, uh, fixed color balance or do you leave it on auto? Great question. Most of the time, um, I do lock my white balance on, usually I just keep it on daylight. And what I'll do in a shoot like this is, since I'm going around to um, various angles and, and I'll just keep the same uh, white balance locked in, I'll use a gray card uh, at the beginning of the shoot. And so in this scene, for example, I'd have an assistant down here, hold the gray card in, in the shadow area, hold it up against a white wall, maybe hold it right in the middle of a sun in the sunlight. And what that does is uh, in Lightroom, you can just use the color picker tool and immediately um, click on that gray card and it'll just perfectly balance everything um, to, to the correct white balance for that area. Um, now, just to expand on, on your question, there are occasions, and we're actually gonna get to that in the next example, where any given scene is going to have different uh, types of light, different colors of light and sources. And what that does is um, you kind of, in one scene, you might have uh, different lights that are competing. So you might have a warm tungsten light versus uh, a blue light and, and it might look unnatural. So in those cases, uh, I also use compositing. So to not only um, recover and balance the, the exposure and the luminance, but also to recover to balance the color. So you know you can use um, you can process a layer a layer differently um, with a virtual copy, you know, for a certain area of the scene and, and fix that white balance and then just patch that one little area in. I might be getting ahead of myself, but let's uh, let's go to one more example here. So here's an exterior of a house in Carpinteria. One raw exposure. This is not processed at all. This is straight out of camera. Um, you go over one, this is as far as I would, as you could push uh, one raw exposure. So just to show you the final version of this photo is there. So once again, just to go back and forth, and there's a few different things happening. So we'll, we'll sort of talk about them individually. So for one, the exposure, the sky, you know, in my opinion, was a little too bright. I brought it down. Also, I did a complete sky replacement, <laughs> meaning I, I, have, I keep stock libraries of you know, various cloud formations that I've shot over the years, and you know, I just have that in a collection on Lightroom, and then I can just find a nice you know, set of clouds that I feel like fits the scene well, and you just make a selection of the sky by itself, you drop those clouds in, you put a blending mode on it, and you know, do play with it until it looks natural. A couple other things to point out. So the, and this is going back to the, you know, what we were just talking about about the white balance. 
So in this photo, since I am correcting my white balance for the outside, you know, the ambient light of the scene, the what's left of the daylight, that that by default makes the interior look very yellow and orange. And that's that's not real. That's not what his home looks like in there. Um, so I was able to sort of brighten it up, re repair that those yellows to make them more pure and white and um, and natural looking. And in my opinion, it, it really brings attention more to the home and makes it pop. Um, just to quickly address a few other things that are happening. So yeah, so first there's the compositing and then the next step after compositing is retouching. Things like this, where the garden wasn't fully ingrown, if you will. So just cloned a few more <laughs> bushes. <laughs> You know, so so part of it is composition. You know, you want to think about what makes the most pleasing composition. Um, so that's one example. Again, the grass, sort of recovering there. Looks like it was starting to die. Other things like this tree. I, I actually went around with a, a strobe um, with a radio transmitter and uh, just sort of popped little bursts of flash around the house. And what that does is accentuates little highlights. So like this tree, these trees here, and just kind of brings more life to the scene, retouching telephone wires. You can see over here, got rid of these wires. So really to just eliminate anything that's a distraction and create the most pleasing composition. And then down here, just adding those two little bushes that I felt you know, really complete this, this sort of border of plants. Um, anyway, so hopefully that, that sort of gives you a good sense of what, why I, I bring my photos into Photoshop. Does anyone, are we good so far? Anyone, am I going too fast, too slow? Yeah, I have a question, Alex. If uh, you're doing this uh, for real estate sale purposes, there are now some very stringent requirements on full disclosure. Exactly. So what do you do about Luckily, that? Luckily, the electric lines you yes. took out. No, no, great, great question. And I, I, I figured I might address that. Luckily, I don't shoot for real estate. I am shooting for architects, builders. And, and so, and that, you know, it's a good question because there's a lot of projects where, you know, you're eliminating uh, maybe an exit sign or outlets and things like that. And you might say, well, you know, that's, that's in the building, but the point is not to take a Xerox of the space exactly how it exists at that moment. Um, the point is to, you know, tell the story about what the architect uh, had, it, had visioned when he first designed the project. And so it, it's kind of, it becomes a mixture of almost a rendering and a photo, but you're, you're creating the most pleasing and artistic representation that, that you can. Um, but yes, if I were shooting for real estate, I would probably leave the wires probably, yeah, not eliminate too much. Not only that, you're not getting paid as much with real estate, so you don't have time to go cleaning up wires and stuff. <laughs> but anyway, anyone else have a question? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, how do you know what how much to do in light and how much to do in before you shift over into Photoshop? Good question. Um, so it kind of depends. I, I've done it different ways. There's certain, it, I think what it comes down to for me is how much time I'm willing to spend on a photo to make it the best it can be. Um, if all I'm really trying to do is, is, you know, and all I have time for is maybe a quick sky, like sky replacement or, or quickly fix the windows, in that case, I might fully process a photo like this, I might fully process it. And let's just do this real fast. So, so we're in develop. You can see my edits. And again, I just did this very quick and dirty. And I'm I'm pressing the uh, forwards. Thank you. What in the, one of the slashes under the delete key, um, which temporarily removes all the edits. I don't know if you guys know that, but quick tip. And so basically, that's a quick edit. And then what you could do, you know, if if I wanted to be very quick about it, is make a virtual copy so it has the same all the same edits. Um, and then what we could do is grab our eyedropper. This is our white balance tool. And then just click on the yellow area. And as you can see, if we go in real close, the interior is now properly 
fixed for the white balance. But look what happened in the exterior. Everything's blue. That's not natural. Um, so for that reason, what I would do in a if I was going for like a quick and dirty fix is I would make these two exposures and bring them both into Photoshop, quickly make a mask around the windows and just drop those in. Um, that would be the quick fix. Now the longer fix and what I usually do if it's you know a well-paying project and I have the time for it and the patience is I will almost do no and I know people who, who literally do no adjustments in Lightroom. They strictly take their brackets, which are maybe every two-thirds stop or one-stop increments. Um, I usually shoot at least nine to 11 uh, different exposures to get the full range. Um, and literally won't, won't even touch any adjustments in Lightroom, except the one thing I do always do is, I'll just do it right now, is... Uh, lens correction, remove chromatic aberration, because that's something that Lightroom handles way better than any Photoshop uh, tool can handle. Yeah, for that reason, I that's always the first thing. And, and if you want, we can talk about this, but there's user presets. So you can just um, set up these presets for yourself where you just say, all right, this, this photo, I just want to quickly fix the chromatic aberration. You just click that and boom, it does it. So you don't have to go into your thing. And that's that's if there's anything you do very fre frequently or, or it's a common occurrence. So that's one thing. And then the other thing that I often do in Lightroom is so, depending, on, depending on the exposure. So if I had to, if it was low light and I had to boost the ISO, I might go in here and and uh, add some noise reduction and a little bit of sharpening. Um, but for the most part, and then actually what I'll do is, let's just reset this, hold on, reset. I will go usually like plus, plus 30 shadow, minus 30 highlight. And, oops, and it's very subtle, but it just brings a little bit of, of the dynamic range back into the photo but not so much where um, it's stretching pixels where they shouldn't be stretched. And, and by that I mean, and just to quickly demonstrate that concept, and I'm sure you guys have encountered this too. So to look at these side by side, so the left one is the fully blended Photoshop um, composite, and the right one is one single raw photo. So. If we look into the shadow area areas, you can see where, I don't know if you can see it on the projector, but in, in the shadows of a single raw exposure that you, you bring up shadows very significantly, um, anytime you bring up shadows, you're going to get some noise. And you know, so you can see a little bit of grain and noise in here where on these, since we had a proper exposure and we didn't actually stretch the raw file, we just we used it as it as it was created in camera. The noise is significantly reduced. Anyone else? While I take a sip. I, I, this isn't really about Photoshop, but I was curious what you think about f-stop. Like I, for the shots that you've shown us, where mm -hmm. it seems like everything's in focus. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Totally good question. So when it comes to um, architecture and landscapes. What I've learned from my mentors and, and research and my own sort of practice is the, uh, you know, the best range is anywhere from 6.3 to f11. And what I've also, you know, some people think, oh, if you want everything in focus, you just shut it as, as small as you can, like a 22. And I, I, what I've, you know, realized and learned is that that's not really helpful um, if you go anywhere above f11, you actually lose a little bit of detail in your shot. Um, not totally sure why, but maybe it's a maybe it's a limitation of uh, DSLRs. But so I always try to be in that range of like 6.3 to f11. In this case, you can see how it's f4, but that's uh, mainly because it was a low light scenario, and um, I didn't really have time to wait for a really long exposure. I mean. And plus, 
there's certain cases where like the wind was blowing in this scene and so this big huge tree um, actually moves a little bit in the wind and so if you did anything longer than a second exposure or a half second then you're, you're going to see a little bit of blur and that's another thing to address is anytime you're you're trying to stack layers on top of each other and something moves in the scene that just made your job like infinitely harder to, to blend those two layers together if something moves. Um, so it's really important in, in cases like that um, to keep a, a small exposure or a short exposure. Go ahead. How do you uh, handle that problem when you do have um, things moving in your, in your separate images and also uh, in one of the other images you had there, you had a person walking through the interior, mm -hmm. and that person was only in that spot on one of the three or four or five uh, images. Yeah. So how do you yeah. deal with that? Great question. So um, I'll take the one at a time. So first, the in regards to people, what my my sort of procedure when it comes to a composite like this is. First, uh, I get my composition, right? So you set up your camera, you adjust the lens, you make sure your composition is the way you want it to be long term. Because especially in architectural photography, it's not like an event where you're going around just snap, snap, snapping, you know, a whole lot of exposures and you go back and find one that's good. You really want to be careful and intentional about the decisions you make before you ever take the photo. In fact, with architectural photography, I'd say 90% of the photo is just setting up the photo. So in a lot of cases, you're, you know, you first you make your composition, then you actually physically walk through the scene, adjusting things, um, you know, putting moving plants or frames just a little bit or tables or chairs, just so everything is pleasing and, and looks nice and doors are closed and there's not, and maybe even cleaning off surfaces or smudges. Um, so that's a big part of it. You want to really perfect the scene before you ever press the exposure. Now, to get to what you're saying, once you once the scene is set up the way you want it, um, you initiate your camera's bracketing of exposures. I always try to do that once no one is in the scene. So you get those brackets, and it's called a what's called a clean slate. And you guys may have heard this before, but a clean slate basically just means it's kind of like a background. So you can always refer back to the background, but if someone was walking through the scene and you initiate your bracketing, they're going to show up like stuttered in different places. And so first, if possible, I mean obviously some scenes you're never going to have no one there, but if possible, you wait until there's no one walking through um, and then you take your bracketed shots, you leave the camera there, you change the setting, and I actually, uh, I use an iPad to control so it, it makes it really handy because in that sense, you, you don't actually physically touch the camera. And that's another thing you have to be really careful of. If you're manually changing your settings, even like a little bit of, of grabbing it could shift it a few pixels. And then once you drop them on top of each other as layers, they'll be a little bit uh, unaligned. Change your settings after you get the bracketed shots, whatever a proper exposure is for the area you're shooting. So I knew that people were walking back and forth from you know the check-in to the terminal. And so once I got the bracketed shots, uh, I changed it to a proper exposure for this area. And then you just kind of wait. You, you watch your monitor, you wait for people to walk by, you click a couple times, and that's where you can spray and pray a little bit more. And then once you gather those layers uh, of various people walking through the scene, um, then once you're in Photoshop, you, have, you basically have unlimited options uh, to sort of drop people in the scene as you like as you as you prefer. Um, so first you would make that blend with your brackets and then afterwards you drop in the people. Hope that answers that question. Um, what was the other part of your question? You kind of have to rely on one single exposure. So for example, say this was uh, a tree that, had, that blew in the wind and in the other shots it didn't. So I can't use the other shots to blend in so instead I would virtual copy that one shot, and then I actually already have actions. Or wait, develop. So I would, you know, lower the exposure, and then maybe even do it again. So create virtual copy, negative 0.13. Now I have these three exposures that are from the same photo, but they're processed at different brightnesses. 
Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then with using those, you would kind of use those same blending techniques. It's not optimal, but it is a, it is like a way to work around that problem. We'll just quickly zip through a, a couple more examples. Um, raw straight out of camera. You know, once the light changes, and that's composited. You know, to get some nice shadow detail. The, in this occasion, I actually just kept the camera in the same exact place because this is. This is part of a series that I do um, that I call 4D photography, but basically it's um, in one photo uh, blending uh, different points in time together. And so I'll sort of leave a camera set up uh, from day to night, for example, or I'll return to the same location. Um, so this is from that series, and you can see this is the final uh, the final edit. And you know you can see it's sort of twilight on the left side. This is more golden hour on the right side. And then, you know, this gentleman just happened to be walking by at some point, um, and I just plopped him in there. I wanted to quickly talk about different types of Photoshop editing. So, so basically, I, you know, I was just kind of thinking about this as I was preparing for this, and I, I sort of came up with four different types of, of or techniques of using Photoshop. So the first is... Uh, distorting existing elements of one single photo so that you know that is retouching so you know getting rid of uh, details in the scene that you could also refer to um, like fashion photographers so you know the classic uh, Photoshop stigma again like you know altering someone's facial features and things like that so that's you know distortion of um, a photo that already exists as is uh, the second technique is <coughs> taking multiple exposures from the same exact location. Um, so like we talked about before, from a tripod. And so uh, you could do HDR and, and have that, you know, do the bracketing. Um, you can wait until things are crossing into the scene differently. And, and you know, this is probably the most common use uh, in, my, in my case. This would be for commercial and, and HDR photos and, and just blending things together to make them look more natural. Um, the third technique is combining two or more photos from completely different places or completely different settings. And that's where what we'll get into, get into in a little bit, which is when real uh, surreal photos come into play and you know just bringing elements from two completely different places and just mashing them together and coming up with something like really unique. Um, like if we jump back here, one of my favorites, this shot here, this is one of my favorites of all time. And so, you know, clearly that's not a real place. I'm taking uh, locations and, and different landscape shots from all different places that I've been. Anyway, so that's the third technique is bringing things together that n never actually coexisted. Editing technique number four is artificially adding something completely from scratch. Uh, and I'll, I'll get into a few examples of that as well, but you know, there's certain tools in Photoshop where you can just, you know, you can create an artificial light flare, for example, or you can, you know, just make shapes and you can color their shapes and add gradients. And so to me, that's, you know, that's this fourth technique of just making something completely from scratch. Going back to technique one, distorting existing elements of a single photo. Just for a few examples. So the only <laughs> the only change that was made to this was using a piece of his left eye and a piece of his right eye to make a third eye. So you know you're not combining a different exposure, you're not doing anything from scratch. It's strictly just using what's already there and manipulating it to create a new concept. What's it called? Oh, a dispersion. So if you're if you want to try this, Google uh, dispersion effect in Photoshop, and there's a ton of tutorials about it. It's uh, you know essentially you stretch out one photo, add a bunch of masks and shapes uh, to make it look like that. Here's actually a, a client project I did for an author. It was a, ended up being a book cover, and so this was my first kind of draft of it. This is actually obviously more than just technique one because you know I'm bringing in other completely other photos and stuff that actually ended up being part of this book cover so here's a panorama that turn that when warped into a circle can become this sort of orb um, so again you're you know that's 
arguably that's one photo that you're just manipulating and, and stretching to look different and to, to ha take on a whole different form. Um, one more example of that, here's a panorama and then flip it around. This is another action. If you're, if you want to um, learn this one, Google search tiny planet effect in Photoshop. You, this can also be achieved with a 360 camera. Um, so this is the second technique that I was talking about where the camera is stationary but you are taking multiple exposures and then combining them together. So basically, you know, you, you put it either your uh, drive mode on rapid fire and then you, as, you know, in this case it's action sports, skiing, snowboarding, whatever, uh, and then just, you know, take that rapid fire sequence of whatever's happening. Um, and then you align them together, you make a little mask around each one, and it ends up as one photo uh, that sort of tells a story of that, that sequence of motion. Um, here's another little example, but obviously completely different context. So it's the same concept where the camera's in one place, something is changing in the scene, and then you just, I made these little slices to show what is you know this progression of time as something in the scene is changing so the moon is setting and the sun is rising simultaneously so that's why the layers get lighter similar concept there's the wharf um, you got these time slices each one is maybe four or five minutes apart each slice um, this is a rocket launch from SpaceX same idea you know you see the intervals and, and it's it's interesting too because you know, based it, it, it's almost like a scientific representation of this based on how far each dot is apart. You know, you can see how the acceleration of the rocket, which, you know, if you're into that kind of thing, it's pretty fascinating. Um, let's see. Another little example, just stacking clouds together. And we could talk about this as well. It's called um, time stacking. So again, if you got a notepad and you want to learn these things, I don't have time to jump into all of it, but Maybe, maybe for another lesson. Um, here's another fun example. Uh, so here is one single exposure of a scene that actually happened as it happened, sitting in our lawn chairs watching the Perseid meteor shower. And uh, the camera was set up on time-lapse mode. So it was taking a, camera, or, sorry, taking a photo every 10 to 20 seconds or something like that. And it would just repeatedly take photos. And the meteors were happening so frequently that in this one frame, you know, every, every, every photo, there would be a meteor in a different place. And then what, you, what I did is bring all those layers into Photoshop and then selectively mask out each meteor that happened and put them into one exposure. And, you know, you might see this and say, oh, you, like that's completely fabricated. You just drop those in, which nothing against that. You could do it with that approach, but with this approach, um, this is literally where the meteors were in a re very active during a very active meteor shower. Obviously, not all at once. You know, they happen at, like at different times. But it's a it's a fun way of sort of showing, telling a story of that night of that experience. Go ahead. How much time uh, elapsed between your first exposure and your last exposure? And the reason I'm asking that question is because. As you know, mm. when the Earth rotates, the stars, stars move. Yep, great point. So the way to combat that is, um, actually, let's see. So you can actually, it's funny you say that because there's a few examples. So going back to the concept of clean slates. So this photo right here is what's called my clean slate. So you need that first uh, sort of background photo, and that will be your very bottom layer. And uh, the purpose of that is, you know, everything will be built on top of this. So you're adding to that clean slate. Same idea. So again, this is technique two. It's cameras in one place. You, you're, so there's a few things happening here. One is, this, the, as you mentioned, the stars move. Um, so this is taking, uh, an, again, taking time lapse, one exposure right after the other. So there's, there's really no lag time. It's as soon as one stops. The other uh, next, the next one begins, and just you know, quick side note: you're you're gonna want a fast card with a fast, a high transfer speed to be able to pull that off. 
Um, and then what you do is you, you bring these into Photoshop, you put the blending mode, mode called light in, and what that does is, is selectively chooses pixels that are brighter than any pixel below it and adds that to the scene. So if you put all the stars on light in, it gets this effect of streaks. Now, arguably, this could be achieved with one single exposure, but you would have to really nail that exposure. To, yeah, exactly. And so, so that's one thing that's happening. And then also, you know, I went around uh, with, a, with different lights. You can see a little bit of a cool cast over here. I had a cool headlamp and a warm lantern and just kind of painted around. So selectively uh, just painted the rocks. And, you know, these didn't all happen at once. Like maybe this area I was on the other side and this area I was right under it. And then this area I was standing right there. And then again, you just you selectively drop in uh, light the way you want to, and that's called that's a technique called light painting. Um, little Joshua tree example over UCSB example, bat hanging on the lizard's mouth example, um, Vegas example, same thing. Suction cup to the roof of the car, or the sorry, the hood of the car. Um, taking a time lapse, just drove up and down. Um, the boulevard until I got a bunch of different exposures and then just kind of blended them all together. There's uh, my proposal picture. <laughs> Somehow I got away with this without her even noticing, but <laughs> um, basically, you know, set up my camera where I knew I wanted it to be. So I took maybe 10, 15 minutes just finding the perfect composition with like the, the flowers in the foreground and everything. Um, obviously, you know, super nervous and jittery, like knowing what I was about to do and somehow, somehow set it up, made my move, you know, we, we, uh, had our moment. And then after that, we just sort of hung out. We got out of the scene. I just left the camera there taking photos as the, the night or sorry, the sun went down, the stars came out, the lights came out. And then I just used those later exposures and blended them in from the side. And so this is, you know, it's sort of this progression of time from, from right to left in one, one photo. And then that, you know, just a slightly different variation in case uh, someone wants to buy this as a print without me in it. <laughs> <laughs> Another 4D shot, 4D shot, day nights. These are a big, big thing I do. Um, so one thing I want to talk about too is how do you come up with the ideas for composites? And... You know, one thing I that I feel like is a misconception is a, as I look through my own work and you know see some of these composites that I've done, um, like this for example, or it's very rare that I will go into a composite knowing exactly what I'm looking for, if that makes sense. So instead, the way I, I kind of approach compositing is I think of photography as collecting assets. So when I'm shooting, and I, you know, I try to bring my camera everywhere, I'm, I'm constantly shooting. Um, and and you know, I, I also like encourage you guys to sort of switch the way you think about this too, is you're not always taking photos uh, for that of that moment so that that can be a standalone photo and exist on its own instead think of it more as you're collecting assets uh, and you're building your own stock library that you can then later refer back to and integrate into projects in the future and so what I'll do is I'll have um, a collection in Lightroom that let's see that is just like you know, I call it stock composite. And so basically any photo that I feel like, hey, that might, that might be a good asset or a good piece to a larger puzzle. Um, so anytime that occurs, I, you know, I would uh, just drop them in this folder and then I would, you know, as a creative kind of exercise, I just sort of browse through this and, and you just start making connections. It's like, all right, you know, there's, there's a cool star photo and then here's like a window photo. And like, hey, what if we what if we combine those, and you know, get that? The point is, you know, I, I don't always know. Like, I didn't seek out like, hey, let's get a photo of like a beach 
with me in the back of a car looking up, you know, the trunk. It just, it kind of happened organically. Like I don't, I don't, I rarely know exactly what the result is going to be. A lot of the times you're just sort of playing around, um, experimenting and then whatever, whatever sort of happens, uh, whatever, you know, stands out to you, uh, usually good things will happen. Um, so just quickly going back to this question. question. Um, all the pieces you use, mm. you generate, correct? You don't use good question. Stock. Um, I'd say, yes, 99.9% .9 of the time, they are my own photos that I've taken at some point or another. However, um, that's, there are certain occasions where um, I might have a concept. So sometimes you do have a concept. Uh, and in those cases, um, you might need to draw from a stock website or uh, Creative Commons, get a license. So here's an example where, um, you know, I took this boat ride. It happened to be the night of a blue moon. And I, you know, I was standing in the back of the boat with my tripod, praying that he didn't hit the acceleration too fast and I fell off. And, you know, later on I get back into Lightroom and I'm looking at my, going through my photos and I see this and I'm like, you know, this could make a really cool surreal composite. And obviously this is the real moon. Um, and, you know, it's cool, but it's, it's, it's not like super impactful. It's not super surreal. And in this case, as you mentioned, I, I found a stock, you know, free stock, uh, high resolution uh, telephoto moonshot and just dropped it right into the middle. Uh -huh. And so, you know, now it, it, it becomes this uh, sort of magical, surreal scene um, by simply compositing a few elements. And again, blending modes uh, added this reflection in the, in the lake to make it look a little more believable. This one I created from, from scratch, so I, I created this eclipse-looking thing. I actually just pulled up a tutorial. I, I knew I wanted an eclipse, uh, but I didn't, I didn't necessarily know how to make it, so I just quickly YouTubed a video, you know, found a simple way to make an eclipse from scratch in Photoshop, dropped it in the background of this, you know, this actual photo, and you know, just became something new. And you know, if I go to the bottom, I can put a, I put a bunch of uh, composites where I started playing around and was never really happy with the results I had so I just sort of gave up on them I was like yeah this is going too far I don't really know what I'm doing here um, and I was like never mind I'm gonna back off so it's not always like a perfect you know synchronicity where everything falls into place or it's trial and error you know so let's just do one together let's do a composite together with the remaining time we have same as before, as I was saying, you know, I, I just sort of drop files into a folder if I think they might have potential to be blended into things later on. Um, so these are some examples. Out of a plane, there's an actual plane window. Looking out the plane window, a cityscape and a starscape. Now, let's just, for this example, let's just say we want to blend all those together and make like a night scene. So first thing I would have to do is um, since I know it's going to be a dark, moody scene, I would edit this to uh, be darker, uh, lower, you know, decrease the contrast, and even take away some of the punchy highlight and, and lower the whites and lower the, lower the highlights. And the reason for that is because if you're trying to portray a, a daytime scene as a night scene, um, then you have to significantly reduce the contrast and the the amount of uh, of light on on someone's on your subject. And so I already kind of played with this and got got a couple of results. But let's just jump into this because I don't I want to at least do something before we run out of time. Um, so select the layers that you want to play with. And again, you don't always need to know what's going to happen. You know, I'm, I could just grab a couple. You guys may have seen this before. Edit in, open as layers in Photoshop. This is huge. This is pretty much the process I go through for any, <coughs> any final photo that I make. Whenever you're compositing two or more photos, there's a number of variables that you have to keep in, in consideration when doing so, so that uh, there's a seamless blend between those photos. So uh, just for fun, 
are there any variables that you guys want to just shout out that you need to consider when blending in images together? Great answer. Light direction. Yeah. Anything else? Perspective. Yep. Perspective, color, exposure, all, all correct. There's a lot of things to think about. So that's, that's part of the challenge when compositing anything. And so these are things that you, know, you need to think of in every context, you know, even if it's just one single photo you're editing, but you especially need to consider those things when blending photos together. So let's just get started with this. What I would do, because I know I want this photo to be the main subject. Um, so you know, first, you need to make this. Oh, go ahead. Um, do you know what size of image you want to end up with? You, you mean like resolution, resolution wise? Um, no, I'm just kind of working on something, mm. and as far as smart objects, right, know, right. So, a couple answers to that. One is I always you always want to work with the highest possible resolution versions. And when you open as layers in Photoshop, that's what happens. And you can see, you know, like this photo, for example, is much lower resolution than this plain shot. And, and you can tell that because it's, uh, it's way bigger. And so by default, Photoshop will, will open them as their, their actual resolution. And so you're not going to lose any resolution here. Um, but in terms of composition, what I will do is... Um, I'll just start working and then the cropping, the, you know, any border uh, treatment or anything like that, that always will come after. So, you know, that's always something that you can address afterwards. Like, it's rare that you would say, okay, I need a square photo and let's make everything fit perfectly. Instead, you know, you kind of just start working and then depending on how the composition looks, then after the fact, you can, uh, you can sort of arrange that. So... So right now I'm using the quick selection tool. So W gets you the quick selection tool. Basically, I know I need to make a selection along the edge of, of the subject. Um, and you know, as anyone, as you guys I'm sure know, there's a hundred different ways to make a selection. So part of Photoshop is deciding on the best tool for the job in that scenario. Um, and so we'll we'll sort of address that in pieces. But right now, you know, I decided for a quick and dirty job. Uh, the quick selection tool is the best tool for this job. Um, so, did a pretty pretty accurate job of finding that selection, but we're selecting the opposite of what I want it to. So what we're going to do is Command Shift I, and you, you don't really notice what happened, but it actually selected everything uh, in its select inverse. So that's what happened. And then with the layer selected over here in your layers panel. You click this button down here. This is create layer mask. <coughs> so now, let's actually, what I'm going to do just to keep this organized, I'm going to put these in a group. I did that with command G. I'll just call it assets. Um, hide that. I'm going to make a new layer at the bottom. Shift delete is fill, fill with black. Okay, so just so we, we kind of have a clean campus, or canvas that we're working with. Now, let's see here. Now, what's our next piece to this? I'd say the plane window is what I want to work with. In a normal project, and a huge part of working in Photoshop is um, staying organized. So normally, I'm not going to do it now because we don't have time, but I would recommend renaming all your files, you know, plane window, cityscape, whatever. Um, and it, it'll really help you later on keep things grouped, keep things named, and organized. So let's play with this. So um, what I want to do, I could use the same tool, and it does a pretty good job at finding those edges, because essentially what I'm trying to do is punch out that window. Um, but it's, you know, I could also use the pen tool, which I quite frequently use myself, especially in architecture because it's extremely precise. Um, you could use the magnetic lasso tool and sort of drag around. I don't tend to think that's super precise, but um, and then the other f way of selections that I use a lot, um, especially in architecture, this is probably one of the most powerful tools in Photoshop in my opinion and one of my most commonly used tools is select color range. 
And basically, what this does is, well, you click on an area, and it selects anything that's similar in pixel uh, to that area. So either luminosity or the color. And wh what's happening here is anything that's red is not being selected. And you can also see that in this little box where it, it portrays this as black and white. And same thing with masking, as you guys probably know, white reveals, black conceals. And so basically what that means is anything that's black is not going to be shown. Um, so what I'm going to do is, and you can also, you know, you can also see this different ways as a white mask. I personally like quick mask. So you hold shift with your eyedropper. You can see the plus sign show up and then you keep clicking. So you click in different areas until all the red is, you know, off of the places that you want it to be. But see, now we see it spilled over the side a little bit and then you could do minus, but then we get into all sorts of trouble. So the, the moral of this story is color range might not have been the best tool for this job. I wanted to show you guys diversity and I didn't want to just keep using the same tool. So we're going to go back to quick selection. Um, here's a little thing I like to do, especially with architecture, is feather your selection before you make it a mask. And what, and what this does is it will add just a very subtle blur to that edge that will ultimately make it more natural. Because if you just have a perfectly sharp edge of pixels, it won't blend accurately because uh, a photo naturally has a little bit of softness to it. Not every photo is like tack sharp. So what I've, you know, what I've sort of discovered is the, the magic number is this 0.7 pixels. Where did you find the, um, the feather tool? Oh, great question. So feather tool um, is shift F6. But there's there's multiple ways to do anything. So just to back up really fast, um, I do actually I did bring um, a list of keyboard shortcuts that I can send to anyone who's interested in using it because um, that's one of the things that I would recommend really getting familiar with, and it will make everything you do so much quicker. Uh, if you don't know, if you if you forget everything involving selections is found up here. So select, modify, you can expand it, you can make it smaller, feather. Um, so that's where it is. So, and you don't see anything happen right now, but you just have to know it happens. And you can look in your history and you can see, yep, I made a selection and then I feathered it, but we don't want to take up space. Okay, so again, this is very imperfect. What I would do if I were you know, if this were a real project and this was going to go to print and it was, could be end up being very big, I would be extremely meticulous about this edge. In fact, I would probably use the pen tool and draw like a perfect curve along this edge. We don't have time for that tonight, so we're going to have just settle with what we got. Um, so same thing as before. You have the, the uh, layer selected, make a mask. Once again, it's the opposite of what we want. So now with the mac mask selected so keep in mind there's a difference between selecting the actual layer and selecting the mask if i do command i on the layer by accident it flip flips all the pixels that's not what we want so make sure your mask is selected command i inverts that mask so now we're looking at whoops we're looking at this window as its own layer with, you know, punched out. So now we can use this as an asset. Um, let me back up a little bit here. I didn't mean to. Okay, so now what I would do, once I get um, a sort of clean, uh, a clean mask of that window, I would go convert to smart object. And someone mentioned this before. And the reason you convert to a smart object, in case you don't already know, is essentially it's preserving the original pixel data without uh, the possibility of destructive editing. Wait, I'm sorry. I don't think it worked. So basically what that means is if you make adjustments to any layer, whether it's perspective correction or scaling it or levels or curves or anything like that, if you make an adjustment to a layer without it being a smart object, 
that adjustment is permanent. Unless you want to go back in your history and undo, 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 which is not optimal, you can never undo that, that adjustment. And so that's where smart objects come in. Um, smart objects are brilliant because you, it will always maintain the original pixel data. You can undo effects, you can take effects off, and you can change them uh, way down the road if you need to. Um, so now we want to transform this. So what I'm going to do is Command T, and basically we want to make it look more natural in this scene. So I want to make it look like I'm sitting next to this window. So basically we're going to go perspective. There's a few different ones you could do. Distort might work, skew might work, but perspective is probably the best starting point. Sometimes I actually prefer distort. So you can sort of you know, get it to look the way you want, the right angle. Let's just call that call that quits right there. Um, now, a few things that are that are obvious obviously stick out. Like one is the color of this thing is like you can see the edges of it. That's not good. So first of all, the order of your layers matters. So I'm going to drag the subject on the top. So now it's, uh, it's above that other layer. Um, now another thing that I, I'm going to start addressing is the difference in color. But I'm, so I'm going to start that and then I'm, gonna, I'm going to come back to it. So we're going to make a curves layer. I use curves all the time with, uh, for color, for exposure, for a lot of things. Clip it, which is this button right here. What that essentially means is it is only affecting the one layer below it. So if I didn't do that, it would affect every single layer below it. Um, but now it's, uh, it's maintaining, it, it's only affecting that one layer. Um, so, whoops, I'm gonna come back to that. So let's see here. So here's, and again, there's, there's a thousand ways to do any one technique, but what I'm going to do is make so what I want next, I want to address these these lines. So I want to make a a selection in this dead zone because all I really need is that edge, the edge of the window. Okay, and then make a new layer. I'm going to put this on as a mask. I'm going to invert that mask. Click on the layer. Scenario selected. Fill with black. Now, what we can do with a brush, uh, a black brush, oops, you can sort of have that fade away into the distance. So, oh, another quick tip. So, um, to change any brush size, hold Control and Option, and then click and drag. And you can just quickly make it smaller. You can quickly make it harder or softer. And so I'm almost always working with, uh, whoops, with a brush at full softness. Um, and then you know you just sort of paint around the edges. And what I'm doing is I'm revealing that black layer um, to have a, have it sort of a more dramatic effect where it fades into blackness. Um, so I'm going to group all these, call that window. So that's our window layer. And now we can start to reveal some background. So let's see, we can start putting things outside the window. Um, and the reason that works, the, the reason that works is because the, uh, the window layer is above the other. So if you hide it, you, it, you, know, you can then see what's behind it. And the reason I did that black layer is so it's not like spilling over the edges, so it's covering everything. Um, and now, you, now is where you can really start playing. So we have these these layers. I can I can sort of see like what we want. Do we want a plain wing? Do we want a starscape? Yeah. So that's another thing. The size is much too big. Um, if I were doing this for real, I would make these all smart objects before changing the size, but right now I'm not going to. Um, so, you know, you could bring this. Let's see, we'll just we'll play around a little bit. So, same here. 
Command T to transform. Let's say, let's just say we want to go with that, okay? And let's say we want to put some stars. We want to replace the sky with stars. So now we could go in and make. And another thing, you know, you want to lower the opacity of something if you're trying to align it. So just bring it down to 50% and then you can see both layers. And so I'm going to align the two horizons, right? So, so the horizon of the star shot is going to be aligned with the horizon of the plane shot. And you're doing that for obvious reasons because you want it to look natural. Um, make it a little smaller. Align that up. Bring the opacity back. Make a mask. Maybe make a gradient. Oh, sorry. So gradient G tool. Essentially, what that means is it's fade. Something is fading from uh, black to white, and you can see that happening on this mask. If you option click, you can see what the mask looks like. Um, again, so I should have mentioned that before. If you option click on the window mask, um, or right here. You can sort of see what that looks like. You're, you're you know, giving yourself a preview of that mask. Um, okay, so, and then another fun thing to play with is blending modes. So, this looks a little sketch. Like it doesn't look natural. Like these don't belong together. But if you want to start experimenting with different blending modes, like overlays, hard light, are good ones. And it sort of merges those two layers together. Um, but in fact, I'm going to actually just back off first. So that might, might be a better solution. And again, you're, it's kind of trial and error. So maybe you, maybe you don't want a plane wing. So he's not even on, he's on a spaceship. Right now I'm using clone tool. I'm using the clone tool to, uh, to remove that, the, rest, the evidence of that wing. And I, I only need to do it enough where, uh, where this over, overlaps. Um, okay, so now let's just quickly see. And, and no, So here comes the color correction. So now we've got all these layers, and they're kind of like how we want them, but overall we still need um, them to, to merge together seamlessly. So I would add a curves layer to everything I have going on here. Um, so I would clip that. Right now I'm just affecting this cloud layer. And what I can tell right away that this it's a little too warm. Um, if I want it to look like nighttime, I might actually let's see, I might actually reduce the white point a little bit so that it's it's a little more it's less contrasty and it's more more subtle. And then what else? The color. So maybe add a little blues. Let's see what else. And just play around, you know, so you might need a tiny bit of green. Maybe a little, take away a little red, so we got a little cyan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that one's actually uh, um, oil rig. So one thing you can do to remove that, so this is kind of imperfect. So keep the same mask, right? So over here, this is my star layer. Click the mask. This little button right here is link. It means link your mask to your layer. So what that means is if you move this layer around, the mask goes with it. But if you click that link, it will unlink the mask in the layer. So now if you click the layer, the mask stays where it is, but the layer moves. So the, the purpose for that is, uh, so first you make the mask, and then you can, you can move the layer around. So I might clean this up a little bit, but um, again, I'm not going to go to too much trouble perfecting that, but maybe just get like a tiny bit. And then let's go back to our window layer. So even the window layer is looks a little too warm. So go in this folder. We have an adjustment already on it. If you double click it, you pull it up again. I wish I had more screen real estate here. Um, and then again, let's go back to our blues. 
Add a tiny bit of blue cast. Let's see, maybe some green. And then I would actually want to do the same thing on the subject, on myself. It's subtle, but it's it, we're getting closer to something that looks uh, like it fits together in one photo. Um, and then, let's see. And then oftentimes, and I, I'm just trying to wrap up here now because we're out of time, but um, now to quickly jump back to Lightroom, it will show up as a TIFF file in, in your Lightroom. And then I always crop in Lightroom instead of in Photoshop because it's less destructive um, and it's just it's easier to refer back to. Um, this is actually a version I did previously which I probably I gave it a little more time a little more care and I think it might have come out a little bit a little bit better but anyway that's a extremely quick and dirty introduction to Photoshop. <laughs> Thank you guys. Yeah, I uh, question. Do you have any uh, other third-party applications other than Photoshop and Lightroom that you like to use? Not really. I don't think I've, I've ever. I've never really used something besides those two softwares. But what I have done is gotten plugins. So there's a plugin for Photoshop called Raya, Raya Pro. Raya Pro yeah. yeah. So I've I've tried that. R R A Y A, and essentially that um, that's <laughs> to help with exposure blending, and so it can. Um, you know, recognize areas of shadow and highlight and kind of make those masks for you. So that's a fun program to play around with, or a plug-in, sorry. Um, but yeah, as far as other softwares, I pretty much exclusively stick to Adobe. I find that um, it's just the, the most effective uh, tool for what I need and the way, you know, the softwares integrate together with dynamic linking, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty on point. But there's a whole lot that I didn't get to that we may have to have another one for. This time goes by way faster than I always expect, but it's been a blast. I hope you guys learned a little something. Awesome. Well, thank you guys again. Yeah.